right? The higher amount made more sense in some other purposes, less sense in others. So it's interesting and useful to suspend disbelief and do something arbitrary. So I'm saying that here as well. I think the cross cut K, we choose some level in between, which by which we don't say we're taking a union approach or an intersection approach, but something in between to identify who is poor. So if we took K equals two, we would have hmm, those two people as being poor, two and four at the right side or are above or equal to two, and we would have person two and three being poor by this definition. Of course, in general, where K goes from small numbers to big numbers, you have the entire range of possibilities, including union, intersection, and so forth. But it has also the in-between cases. This is, of course, especially useful in the extreme cases where you have many dimensions where it can go wrong either way. Next step, aggregation. I've just told you identification. Now let's talk about how to aggregate up to get one indicator. So aggregation. First, we get rid of the people who are non-poor. Why consider them? Goodbye. That K, of course, determines who is poor, so you have to include it in the definition of the matrix now. So the deprivation matrix goes from this to this, as does the count, where you have zero now for that last person who is not considered poor anymore. Notice I am intentionally not paying attention to certain deprivations in society. That's being done because the primary focus would be people who have a multiplicity and perhaps higher levels of deprivation as a result than the people at the lower end with one deprivation. Now there's some argument here because the depth of deprivation may serve to think, make us think, now what should we do, trade-offs and so on. But you have to bear in mind that we're starting with ordinal data. We're starting with data where those trade-offs may not be possible. And so if you begin where I begin, you're sort of forced to go, and I could prove this, you're forced to go to a simple way of characterizing the identification approach. But I can at least go further in the uh, aggregation approach, and that's where I'm going to proceed right now. Okay, we can define G1 of K, G2 of K, G alpha of K. Let's start with the headcount ratio. Everyone's familiar with the headcount ratio. In this case, we have two people out of four who are poor. Obviously, the incidence is a half. But let's suppose that uh, the number of deprivation rises for person two. Rise. Okay. What happens to our measure of poverty? Nothing. No change whatsoever. We have a kind of dimensional monotonicity being violated. We, that's what we called it in the paper. It essentially is saying it's not very sensitive to the intensity as expressed by our breadth measure, the intensity of poverty. We'd like to have a measure that does have that sensitivity. So let's go back to the original matrix. There it is with the zero for the person, not the one, the fake one. And it would be nice to augment information. Hmm. So let's look at the deprivation share. Two out of four for person two, th four out of four for person three. If we average across the people who are poor, it's about three out of four dimensions in which people are poor on average. So the average intensity among the poor is three-fourths. That might be useful information to take into account in measuring poverty. So let's multiply the headcount times this average intensity indicator to obtain our first measure and the one that's been used most generally, M0, the adjusted headcount ratio. H times A, as you can calculate directly, is 3 eighths by multiplying the two. But interestingly enough, if you take a mean of that matrix, you get 3 eighths as well. One, two, three, four, five, six ones. Overall, 16, 3 eighths. So another mean-based measure that makes it very easy to calculate. Statistical properties are quite nice, et cetera. There's the number, obviously, and we continue. By the way, if person two had the additional deprivation, M0 would rise, wouldn't it? Because A would rise, indicating a greater intensity. 
Bingo, that's what we want. It satisfies dimensional monotonicity. There are a number of observations about this measure, and let me pause for a second because it is one that's been used quite a lot. It uses ordinal data. That means that no matter what cardinalization you happen to choose for whatever purpose, it will work with that, or with that cardinalization and give you the same number as with any other cardinalization. So if you take self-reported health and go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, like Angus Deaton has done, and I've done in the paper in Journal Health Economics, but it, let's say I'm not really interested in that. I think it should be 1, 8, 29, 76, 52. And of course, the cutoff will likewise be transformed. The same level of poverty, identifying who's poor, etc. It's all there. It's independent of the cardinalization. This is crucial. If you go even further to categorical variables, like sanitation can be, right? <laughs> you have bunches of, uh, of levels of the variable which are seen to be non-deprived, others that are seen to be deprived. You don't need to compare with the group don't need to compare within this group, you still can use our approach to on those sorts of data. That's remarkable, okay? So I'm forcing that on you because we need to use it for those sorts of variables. The usual approach is just to cardinalize and assume, you know, hope that it's going to work out fine. But as I showed with work by Angus Deaton, that if you recardinalize his health indicator and talk about his result that said uh, uh, retired people uh, have lowering levels of, of health inequality, it goes away. The main results can disappear if you rescale the variables. Obviously, he was using variance, which is very sensitive to this. So our measure doesn't have that proper property. It has no problem with rescaling. Okay, uses ordinal data. Second, it's very similar to the traditional poverty gap, H times I, except now it's H times A. So you can see the intuition there. That's now our measure of intensity. It's not depth intensity, it's breadth intensity. Okay? All right. It's decomposable across dimensions. After you've identified who's poor, you can say, well, here's how much that variable was responsible. It's like a source decomposition, isn't it, in inequality analysis? Okay? And the formula is just very simple. You take the percentage of the people, H, uh, HJ, who are poor and deprived in J, that domain. Okay, so that's HJ. In my case, with equal weights, divide by D, average up. And that is the overall M0 indicator. This is a very powerful extension of the kinds of decomposability we've seen with unidimensional achieve such great results. Okay. Also, and this is where I get in, but I'm not going to give you my three or four pages of axiom. Right, is anyone happy? <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, you can characterize this measure, the identification and the aggregation, through an approach that's based on freedom. And I have a paper coming out in the Handbook of Social Choice and Welfare in which the theorem is given in that context, and I just basically draw it into this context and show how under a certain number of very simple axioms, there's no way besides this way of measuring that you can, you can um, ad address measurement with the constraints that I'm bringing up, the ordinal constraints and so forth a priori. Right. So, M0 only requires ordinal. What about cardinal? Suppose that we have the ability to measure depth in each dimension. What can we do then? I think you know where we're going. So go back to this matrix, normalize gaps, G1 of K. Look at the average gap, all those non-zero entries across the dimensions of the poor. That's called G, average up, tells you on average how poor the poor are. Multiply that times M0, or multiply H times A times G, and you get what I call the adjusted poverty gap, what we call the adjusted poverty gap based on uh, my work, the poverty gap stuff. So, cool. Guess what? What's really cool is this is just the mean of that matrix. So, take the entries, add them all up, divide by 16, that's the 
adjusted poverty gap. Analogous 100% to the unidimensional case, easy to understand in that sense. Once you come to the measurement question, it's quite easy to, to explain. Obviously, if in a deprived dimension, a poor person becomes even more deprived, then this will rise. Poverty will rise. Okay. It satisfies, therefore, a form of monotonicity. Uh, of course, we could look at the squared gaps. You know what's coming on. Take the mean of that matrix. Yes, that's what we obtain, M2. It reflects incidence, intensity, depth, severity, focuses on the most deprived. Go to the next step with the alpha there, and you see the generalization to FGT is complete. It satisfies all sorts of properties I won't bore you with because our main issue is how to take what we've done really in M0 and apply it in the real world. Now, my colleague will begin in about, what, five minutes, is it? Five minutes? Uh, we'll begin the discussion on that. But let me just describe to you some of the issues. I want to give you an idea of how weights can matter and what they do to identification. It's really quite interesting because these examples are from other people who's, who have done multidimensional approaches in other cases. They didn't know that it would fit within, uh, within our, our environment here. So suppose that we have uh, a weight of two on the first dimension and weight of two-thirds on the other three dimensions. Take a cutoff of k equals two. Now let's reason who is poor in that environment as a result. Well, it's exactly the same as saying in words, you are poor if you are income poor or if you suffer two or more deprivations. Raise k a little bit, 2.5. Or if you want to do like in the Mexican experiment, okay, make it a strict inequality, the same discussion would apply. You're poor if you're income poor and suffer one or more other deprivation. Okay? So you can see how identification is shifting around due to the K changing with weights. That interaction is quite interesting and intriguing, and we're studying these interactions right now. This later definition is actually similar to one found in the book, uh, Brian Nolan, Whelan, uh, quite a while back. So you can take the entire approach, as I've done for equal weights, and address the issue, if you can, of weighting one dimension more or less than the other. Now, the usual way of thinking about weights is to start with the focal point of equality. People naturally think that way. But if you know that one dimension is more important, you know, the conceptual way of thinking about it is, well, how many times more important than another variable? And so people are able to calibrate, oftentimes within some range anyway, so you start seeing robustness questions coming in very quickly. That can be done. Uh, Sabina will present an example where she's looked at the MPI and robustified it. Very interesting uh, discussion where you change weights and see what happens. Okay? The interesting question is, what would be natural weights beyond equality? And I've immediately thought, when we were at the uh, beginning stages of this, that nested, nested equal weights is so natural. People understand it within you have various dimensions that you consider to be equal. Within them, you have variables which you consider to be equal. If you can do that, if you can construct the data in that way, then the defensibility of that becomes much more straightforward when you appeal to the intuition and focal points of individuals. But there are many, many other dimensions and other ways of constructing weights that have been studied through an entire workshop at OFI. And so, Rihanna, were you involved in that workshop? Uh, yes, so you organized it. Uh -huh. So there are m a multiplicity of ways of waiting. And all that I would appeal to is that many times people want to, to immediately instruct data to tell them what weights should be. And I sort of take a less excited view of that approach because it's a normative question, straight and simple. It's very importantly nor normative. What is going on in terms of weights? And so what comes out as the dimension that's really making 
the variation going up and down may not